a little bit of a special treat. I want to tell you what more we can do. And in this question, what we're going to discuss is what happens when we need to move beyond Network X. Because it's a very complex topic, and there's a lot to discuss. And I can show you a bunch of graph, al graph algorithms pulling from networkx.algorithm. Here's, here's maximum cut, here's, or here's maximum flow, minimum cut, here's finding clicks, here's all these different partitionings, here's shortest path. And for the most part, you can say, OK, I just write these down on a piece of paper, and I can memorize them and use them. But what you'll discover is, for a lot of real-world problems, this becomes really difficult to actually model. And one of the limitations of this is the core tool. NetworkX is a fantastic tool. It is extremely convenient. It has no compiled code, so you can install it anywhere where you can install Python code. You can just pip install it and move on with your life. But as a consequence of that, and as a consequence of it, how it models things, it is not particularly efficient. It cannot model graphs of a particular size. And it can't handle a lot of situations that we really genuinely want to handle. Let me show you what would come after Network X if we were so inclined. Here's one of the ideas that we have talked about many times over and over and over again. Whenever we use a tool like NumPy or Pandas, we think about these tools as a restricted computation domain, working with a NumPy and D array or a Pandas array or a Pandas series or a Pandas data frame. And what we mean is, we no longer deal with individualized entity manipulation. We have some manager class that wraps around our entities, and then we work through that manager class. And because we have that intermediation, we can drop down to the C level, and we can get away from all of the things that make Python fundamentally very difficult to optimize. Things like memory layout, so getting everything cache locale, Things like the extreme generality of Python, dynamic dispatch. We can get away with those completely, and we can say, oh, this NumPy and DRA is not some arbitrary set of numbers which have whatever dynamic dispatch to, to control or, or the rules of how you add or subtract them, but they're actually contiguous in 64s with no automatic promotion, and there's only one way to add one to them. You just use the single assembly language structure for that, or maybe even use some SIMD instruction. Well, this is exactly how we want to introduce efficiency into our code, but it's exactly not what NetworkX does. NetworkX operates entirely at the pure Python level. So one of the things that we might want to do, if it were our prerogative to look beyond NetworkX to solve problems with very, very large graphs or to solve problems with very high complexity where we're just paying too much of a cost at the pure Python level, is to think of a way to be able to represent an individual entity, in this case a node, such that it can be boxed and unboxed. We want some protocol for taking this data and devolving it down to the machine level and then reconstituting up at the, at, the, at the Python level so that we can interact with this nicely. So that's probably the starting point. Network X doesn't give it to us, but it does give us the ability to do some very sophisticated things. Graphs where the nodes themselves are graphs, very easy to do. Graphs where the nodes are some arbitrary data class, trivial but it doesn't give us an easy way to represent these. Network X chooses the adjacency list formulation because it's a dictionary of dictionaries of dictionaries. And you can think, basically, the dictionary itself is really just the adjacency list. The, the key value entries, the key and the values are being stored in some contiguous block of memory. And pretty much the key value is the what's connected to what. Well, that's an adjacency list. For some particular algorithms, we may want a matrix formulation. And so it may be the case that we might want to either choose whether we want the adjacency list formulation or the matrix multiplication, and we might even want to encode that. We might want a graph that's not a digraph versus a, a undirected graph, but we might want one that's an adjacency list graph and one that is a matrix graph, which then defines what operations you can do effectively, and you can convert from one to the other or what is efficient. So we might want to have finer grain control over those because it's not the case that one of these formulations is better than the other. But there's more that we want to do. And this is where it starts getting really complicated. One of the problems with the tools that we use is that if we can figure out how to model exactly the problem as it's described in the textbook in terms of Dijkstra's shortest path, a star, bipartite matching, maximum click, maximum flow, minimum cut, and we can figure out how to encode all the details exactly the way the network X wants them, with edge data represented exactly the way network X wants it, with the nodes having no information to, to identify 
you know, what, what choice should be taken as you go through this algorithm, then everything will work fine. But this ends up being very complicated practice as we saw with our challenge problem. It's the case that if we need to find shortest path with some additional policy-based rule set, oh, shortest path, but you can only go from this to this. And that shows up very often. If we're looking at network routing, there may be particular rules for how we can go to the next hop. And we may be forbidden to go to a next hop under certain circumstances that cannot easily be captured in the graph. It may also be the case that if we're doing something like airline fares, there may be rules that you can only follow the next path if you've followed a certain number of items beforehand. And as a consequence of the way, in which the algorithms in Network X are written, there's really nothing we can do to fix this other than, or to implement this other than, try to encode it on the graph itself. We have very few axes by which we can control this. In fact, this is the code from Network X itself for shortest path, for bidirectional Dijkstra, which is what it'll do if you have shortest path on a die graph and you're looking from some source to some target. Well, all we can specify is the dictionary key to use for the weight, that is the most that we can possibly do, and it'll minimize over that. And if we move past this doc string, we can see that there's actually quite a lot that's going on in this algorithm. For the most part, if you look at network text, most of these algorithms are a pretty clear implementation of what a reference textbook says. This is the way in which to implement bidirectional Dijkstra. And I think the core assumption is if you need more, you'll just re-implement these from scratch. But as we know, Whenever you get a library and it says, oh, if you need another version of this, just rewrite it from scratch. No, I think I'm going to spend five hours Googling. I'm going to spend five hours on Stack Overflow, just trying to avoid having to write any code myself. Well, one of the things is there's not enough data that's provided in this algorithm, or there's not enough levers of control provided by this algorithm to really implement anything else. But there are places where we could implement this. For example, there are choices that are made. There are choices in Dijkstra to decide whether or not to take a path or not. But that's not available to you. And what you could think is, every one of these algorithms should at minimum be implemented not as a function, but as some sort of coroutine or generator that yields out the current state of the algorithm and the current choice that it's trying to make and then accepts whether it should make that choice or not. Because that would significantly open up our ability to implement these algorithms and we no longer need to pass in callbacks or pass in the string name of the dictionary key to look up. Instead, we could maybe implement this as a coroutine of some sort. Almost no graph library I have ever seen provides you with this idea. The idea that, at the most part, they give you maybe a callback, but I've seen almost none of them that you can actually implement as a coroutine. The ability to say, oh, let me see what the next choice is. Let me model the, the process as a coroutine, and then look at the next choices, and then decide via sending back to the coroutine whether to take this or not. But you could implement things like policy-based shortest path, you can implement a lot of really valuable algorithms in that fashion. And you could devolve the requirements on the modeling of the nodes or the vertices. Another thing that you'll see that NetworkX does not provide is it's a mutable structure, which means if you need to mutate this graph, well, if you're doing that in order to determine whether some analysis gives you a better overall graph, for example, gives you a better maximum flow, well, if it didn't work, you better unmutate this. These tools need copy on write with simple layering because as the graph gets larger and larger, the amount of data you need to copy is going to get larger and larger. So what you really want is some sort of graph tool that gives you the ability to model the underlying data as an unboxed raw machine level data that allows you to store that contiguous in memory, that allows you to have hooks into each one of the algorithms in the form of either a coroutine or maybe even some sort of callbacks, maybe even both of those, that allows you to customize those algorithms and then allows you to make decisions on how to trans transform the graph as you go. Ideally, what you could do, and this is another thing that I see very few graph tools, at least in Python, give you the ability to do, is allow somebody to implement things like shortest path if the graph changes during the shortest path itself. Almost all of these are eager algorithms that assume that the graph is static. But what happens if, for example, you take an edge and that controls what edges you might take next? Sure, you can model that by, by sprawling out the graph itself, but it's going to get really ugly and really big. 
there is an entire universe of working with graphs beyond NetworkX. NetworkX is a fantastic tool. It is extremely convenient, but there is room out there for a significantly better tool. And I'm curious if any of you might be interested in thinking about how to write that. But that is our brief introduction to all of the things that you can do with the graph. I know there may be a bunch of questions that you might have. Why don't we take a couple of questions and wrap up this session with a little bit of discussion? Cameron? The policy-based routing challenge is extremely difficult to actually implement without going all the way down to the basically rewriting all of these tools from scratch, rewriting the entire algorithms from scratch. It is a very simple problem. Figure out what the shortest path is with one tiny additional rule, and yet it is enormously complex. What I think this means is that fundamentally, when we're designing around this restricted computation domain idea, we have to be really, really careful what levers of control we give to our API. And most of the tools that we work with have this extreme sharp drop, this cliff, where if it doesn't comport with what we want to do, we fall off this cliff. I'd be very curious to see if somebody has a simple way to solve that problem that scales up to 1,000 or 10,000 nodes with relatively high connectivity between these nodes. Because I struggle to find something efficient that could do that just using these tools. The other thing that I want people to think about a little bit more is we can look at graph algorithms in a very trivial fashion. We can talk about the textbook algorithms. We can talk about what the nodes might be if it's a very mathematical example or it's a very machine learning driven example. But what I want you to think about is where do graphs show up even in code that otherwise wouldn't be written by somebody who has a mathematical inclination? Where do graphs show up when we talk about things like workflows, when we talk about things like who reports to whom in the organization. Think about this. If, for example, you had an organizational chart of who reports to whom, can you partition that chart in order to reorganize the, the group more efficiently, in order to minimize the amount of overhead that is taken in order to get information from one side of the organization to the other, in order to, for example, split the company into two parts while still retaining the skill sets that you need on both parts, that's a bipartite matching problem. If you have a graph and you say, well, you know what? This is the one company, but we need to split it into two companies. Can we organize these two nodes into two separate companies that have the connectivity that we need? That might be a bipartite matching problem. All of these problems have depth that we don't often uncover because we don't often think about our problems in terms of graph. And one of the starting points that I commonly encourage people to think about is anytime you see in your work, something which a business user would describe to you in the form of a workflow, and they'd start to draw bubbles. Think about using a simple modeling with NetworkX in order to model that. And I'll even show you what I mean. Let's say there is some workflow process that somebody has given to you. Load some data. Once you load that data, what do you do? You tell people the data is loaded. You send an email, right? If this fails, what do you do? you warn or you page the data ingestion team. If you manage to load that data, what do you do next? Well, then you do some processing of that data. If this succeeded, what do you do next? Well, you send the nightly report to the stakeholders. If this fails, what do you do? Well, maybe you page another team. Maybe you page the analysis team because the senior management are going to get unhappy. This is a fairly simplistic workflow. This is very much like make or the only thing that you can really do if something fails is kind of fall off to the side. But you could think that you might need to do something else. Like you page the analysis team, and then you trigger another action. Maybe you send an alternate report. Or maybe you're doing multiple of these reports in tandem, and you only page the analysis team under certain circumstances if you have all of these modeled. Naively, you might think that you can implement this with just you know class, with all of these methods, and if-else logic. And personally, I think that you might be able to find a coroutine formulation that works very nicely for this. But if it's your goal to visualize what this process is, so somebody can look at a visualization and say, 
where are we in the process? Is this still happening? Has this happened yet? Then using Network X will give you that very simply. You could have a Network X digraph that represents each process in your workflow as a simple data, graph, a data class and implement those processes in that fashion. And so here, this is the name of the process and some information about it. And then just construct these nodes as a digraph. Similarly, we have, many of us have invested in extraordinarily complex workflow tools that are very, very detailed and require a lot of learning. And the value from those tools is what? The execution of the workflow? No, I can write and execute for this workflow very easily. The visualization? No, I mean, I can visualize it. Yeah, the network, the network X layout is a little bit hokey sometimes, and it bounces around sometimes, and it's not as good as my graph is layout, but that's something I could solve. Largely, what those tools help is maybe if I want to point and click and drag nodes around some of that front-end visibility, but is it really the case that I want to adopt a humongous project just to ensure that this thing gets executed when I can write the executor in 10 or 15 lines of code? And how often is it the case that these workflows need to have first-class modeling of the entities? If this isn't a human workflow for some tasks, but some sort, of, some sort of legal workflow for identifying if a payment can be accepted or not, there's steps that you have to take as, in a, within a certain jurisdiction to check this, and then you check this, and then you check this, and then you check these two things. You might need to be able to answer to somebody on the phone, why is my payment held up? Oh, I can see on the graph this is here. And without a first class modeling, it's gonna be very difficult to do that. Now, I actually think that the coroutine does give you that first class modeling, but it requires a little bit of transformation back and forth. Whatever the case may be, modeling this with graph thinking in your head is going to make a significant difference to your ability to understand what that code does, your ability to communicate where that code is in the process, and your ability to apply these algorithms to actually answer useful things about that code in that process.